Thank you, Ms. Connie. Appreciate you singing. You are my lifeline. In everything that we do, we have to realize that we can only be connected into salvation through Jesus. And through that, we have that lifeline. We have that power to accomplish what God has in store for us. In just a few minutes, I want to talk to you about Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to that. But one of the things that we're going to talk about today is we're talking about how to go fishing. Talking about the uh, analogy of how when God called his disciples, he said, he said, you used to do this. Now I want you to do something new. I want you to try something that I want you to do. And when doing that, we have to look at what is it that God has called us to do and how can we apply what God wants us to do. In leadership, it is called in these four simple areas. The first one, if you want to take a little bit of leadership seminar right here, it's awareness. It's awareness. In order for you to make a change in your life, in any aspect of your life, you first have to be aware that there's a problem. And once you are aware there's a problem, then you have to say, God, I need you to fix this issue. So then he gives you vision. He gives you visioneering and understanding that I'm aware that there's a problem. Here is how I want you to fix this problem. I'm going to open your eyes spiritually so you can see exactly what you need to do. And then he calls it strategy. Then you have to figure out what is the game plan. I understand there's a problem. God has given me a vision. I understand that I should do something. But how do I implement the strategy? And in our churches and in our life, I understand awareness. And I, I understand vision. And I can create a strategy. But the last point is the hardest point upon your life, upon my life, and in the church's life. The last one, to implement change, life change, Direction, change, not only do you need awareness, vision, strategy, but you need courage. You just have to have enough guts to do it, don't you? I see the problems. I understand that I'm lacking in certain areas. And I fall on my knees before God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm aware. And God gives you that passion within your soul. He gives you an understanding, and he gives you a vision of what your life could be like, what ministry could be like, what your marriage could be like, what your job could be like, and he gives you that vision. And then he tries to give you the implementation of that vision through strategy. But it all boils down to that last word, doesn't it? Courage. Am I going to continue to do what I've always done. And you know the old saying, and if you've always done what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. We have to make implement changes. The disciples were on the sea. They were fishing and they fished all night. In Luke chapter five, they said they were fishing all night and they were tired and they toiled all night and they caught nothing. In other words, they were fishing but they were fishing in the wrong place, the wrong time. And somehow, these professional fishermen went all night, toiled all night, worked all night, and they caught nothing. They were tired. They came back to the shore. They were mending their nets. And then along came Jesus. And when Jesus came into their life, Jesus made a definite impact within their life, and he started teaching the multitudes. And he was standing in the boat, the very tool the disciples used to catch fish. He was in their boat, and Jesus told Peter, he said, I'm going to use your boat, and here's what I need you to do. I need you to launch out into the deep. I need you to cast away from the shore. I'm going to stand on your boat and then I'm going to have you do something that is outside of the box. I'm going to ask you to put your nets back into the water, not on the side that you used to fish with and you caught nothing, but I want you to throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Peter says, Jesus, now come on. I'm tired. I'm the fisherman. You're the rabbi. Why don't you teach? I'll fish 
And Jesus said, do what I've asked you to do. And if we don't do what God has asked us to do, we will toil all night or our entire life and catch nothing and be on that road of worthlessness in our minds. And Peter finally said, I don't want to do it, but I will. He cast the net on the other side. Great, I don't know why, bunches of fish. What, what do they call fish? Gobs, bunches, pool, a bunch of fish jumped in the net. So the net began to break. So they threw the fish in the boat. The boat began to sink. So they called all the other disciples, hey, get your boats out here. So all the boats were filled. And Peter fell down and worshiped Almighty God because at that time they realized that Jesus had the authority to change everything about them. He had the authority to change their livelihood. He had the authority to even change the physical circumstances. They were fishermen. They were tired. But because of Jesus, what they were fishing for came to them. Then Peter got up and he talked to Jesus. In verse 10 it says this. Let's start with verse 9. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Have courage. From now on, you're going to be catching men. In other words, a vision has been established. These men were going to change the very foundational aspects of their life. You're not going to be fishing in the water any longer. I have just proven to you I could do that without you. I don't need you to catch fish. From now on, I'm going to give you a new purpose. I'm going to give you the courage. Fear not. I'm going to give you a new calling in your life. And that's to catch the most important thing people for Jesus Christ. It is a fundamental issue when they cast their nets into the water that they thought they were doing what they could do. And they were successful at what they thought they could do. But just because they were doing it didn't mean that's what Jesus wanted them to do. And when we encounter Christ and Christ gives us an awareness. He gives to us, you know what, I'm just not happy. You can put your scenario in that, whether you're not happy where you are financially, maybe you're not happy where you are spiritually, maybe you're not happy where you are in your relationships, you're not happy, and all of a sudden, there's awareness, the light bulb clicks on, and you say, wow, I am just not happy. I'm just not there. There's no sense of passion within my soul. There's no strength within my life. I just feel like I'm going through deja vu all over and over again. And that awareness takes place. And that's the first process that God uses to change our very existence. Our purpose changes our desires. Is we first have to have an awareness that I am not being fully used what God wants me to do. So after the awareness comes God's. We, we personally become aware. God implements within our hearts and a soul a vision, destiny, purpose, passion. And then we start dreaming what it could be like. We start dreaming what our life could be like. We start dreaming what relationships could be like, what our finances could be like, what ministry could be like, in our set, what the church could be like. We start looking and dreaming, and God gives us a vision. And that vision that God gives to us is what we see when we dream, what we feel when we hope. And that vision should be the catalyst within our soul to say, every decision that I make has to be made from the God-given vision. I cannot be satisfied with me fishing any longer. 
I can't be satisfied with me doing my way any longer. I have to say, God's vision is what motivates me. It is what captivates me. It is what makes me who I am. When we become aware and we know that we can't make it any longer and we ask God to give us vision and then we see what it's like. We see where we want to go, whether it's in our personal life or it's in our ministry life, whether it's in your home or in your church, when we see what it could be like. We have to take every, every, every issue personal and accomplish that goal. So when you do that, then the strategy takes place. And uh, I, the Lord has really done some, some fun things within uh, my life and my ministry. Um, I can't believe I did that. Brennan, I need you to run to my office, if you don't mind, <laughs> and get my, can you believe, get my vision statement that I just made out and, and um, stink. Can you believe that? I was, about, I was laying the line to give to you the vision for the future. <laughs> anyway, but now I don't have that. So anyway, I will have that. Ah, that frustrates me. All right. Uh, so, so, so did y'all, y'all know the story, but no. So let's go. Uh, so let's catch some fish, and then I'll go back and talk to you about the vision, how we're going to do that. Number one, you need to go where the fish are located. You need to go where the fish are located. When you're looking at catching fish, you're no longer going to be fishing You're going to be doing something greater than fishing. You're going to be catching men and women for the cause of Christ. So as a church, we have to go where the fish are located. Do we realize that people that do not know Jesus Christ, they are not knocking on Glenville's doors and coming into church on Sunday morning, are they? They're not wrapping their head around saying, oh, I need to be at church. I can't wait to come to Glenville. I can't wait to come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't wait to quit drinking. I can't wait to change everything. I just can't wait to do that. The outside world that do not know Christ, they are not waiting to come in here. What we need to do is we need to be proactive, go into, launch a little deeper, throw the net on the other side of the boat and say something different that's going to transpire and transform their life. The, the girls' conference that Rachel had in here yesterday had over 100 girls in here that, that, were, that were just worshiping God. Some of them gave their life to Christ. They had to make an event, a life-changing event, for kids to see what Christ can do within their life. Upward Soccer, we're going to have over 300 kids in Upward Soccer. We're going to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, every Saturday. We're going to do something to go where they are in order for them to see that Christ is real within their life. We can't play the game. We have to launch into the deep. We have to have new strategies. We need to go where the fish are located. We need to get into our community. We need to do things that's going to change people's lives. We need to go. And when the disciples were fishermen, they knew how to fish. And Jesus was telling them, you toiled all night long. You worked to the best of your ability. And you failed. Now, since you can't do it, let me give to you something that you can do. I want to empower you. You understand fishing Now you're going to do something greater than fishing. You're going to fish for men. You're going to fish for me. So go where the fish are located. And understand how the fish behave. Well, thank you, Brennan. I appreciate that. This is a good idea. So why would you take those out of my notebook? You trying to embarrass me when I'm preaching here? Last thing you should do is take stuff out of my notebook like that. Okay. Don't do that again. I worked for a blind preacher one time. Have I told you my blind stories? He, he had to totally rely on me. And I, that would not be a smart move, to re- totally rely on me. And he was a blind pastor. We'd go out to eat, and uh, we would play tricks on him. He loved Chinese food, and uh, he loved Chinese with hot red peppers. And he said, Bruce, take those peppers off. Okay, sure. So he would take, I'd take the peppers off, and so he'd eat it. So every once in a while, we'd put a red pepper on his fork, and he would just eat that red pepper. He'd swallow that and his head would start turning. He'd just get so mad at us because he had no control. When people take advantage of you, it it is so sinful. It is so sinful. (laughs) We may have to delete this, but he had to go to... (laughs) Now you got me telling stories about my blind preacher buddy. 
he had to go on a trip, so I had to take him to Love Field in Dallas. And uh, here, you know, everybody, obviously, he's blind, but, you know, I'm here, I'm holding his arm like that, and he's walking through the airport. He goes, he goes, Bruce, I gotta go to the bathroom. I said, no way. <laughs> you know, I gotta go to the bathroom. I said, oh. <laughs> okay. I said, I'll take you to the entrance. So I went to the entrance, and ladies, excuse me, but there's urinals lined up against the wall. So he'd go out and tap his little thing. So he found the ends of the urinal, but he was in between the two urinals. So I had to make a decision. So guess what I did? I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. He went to try to flush. And I said, I said, Bob, I think you missed. He goes, I can't believe you let me do that. I said, yeah, that's all right. So Brennan, don't do this again. Okay, you're just embarrassing me. Let me give to you my dream. Awareness became vision. And through vision is application to do something great. What is the vision of Glenville? And you'll see our vision statement and our purpose statements around the church. The vision of Glenville is to continue to develop and maintain ministries of excellence. So that when people experience Glenville, they see an innovative, creative, and well-balanced church. If we are aware that there are issues that are not innovative, creative, and well-balanced, it's time that we take what we know is to be a weakness and turn it into a well-balanced, creative, innovative church. The unchurched world are not coming to our doors for entertainment. The unchurched world needs us to impact them for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now how we do that is when we walk into their lives and we invite them to ministry, we must make sure that we are not playing the game of church because they don't like church. They don't like Jesus. They think that we are a gas bag, pious, better than them in our mindset. What we must do is we must give to them a holy passion and a love of God. And how we do that is when we walk into the door, we are ready to love them and minister to them so when they actually do see the power of Jesus through you, they can understand that God loves them and we must motivate them to give their life to Christ. So I wanna take a few minutes and I just wanna share with you, uh, we had our, our deacons and our staff had a seven hour meeting yesterday and we did an evaluation of every one of our ministries. There is absolutely zero ministries that are taking place at this church that is not under the microscope of evaluation to make on purpose excellence so that when people experience Glenville they see an innovative, creative, and well-balanced church. If that is awareness comes to vision. Vision goes to strategy. Strategy, then we have to have courage to implement what God has called us to do. Let me give you a few of them. We are going to develop Glenville a church-wide group, small group format. Starting on September 7th, we're gonna launch community groups and try to encourage the majority of our church to get involved in small groups where community will be built, assimilation can happen, and ministry will be shared. September 7th, a brand new launch into our future with our small groups. Develop volunteers to prepare ourselves to have a two-service format. We need to double our volunteer basis. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to implement, we're gonna have people come in at the nine o'clock service, and then we have a 1030 service. And we're gonna to try to get every one of our volunteers to double their workforce. That means we need to have two sound men. We need to have two video guys. We need to have two uh, lighting guys. We have to have two sets of nursery workers, two sets of children's ministries, two sets of youth pastors, two sets of band. We have to have two sets of everything in order to have a two format. So what we do, I'm gonna ask you, if you come to the nine o'clock service, you serve in the 1030 service. 
If you come to the 1030 service and you say, I enjoy the 1030 service, it's time to serve somebody at the nine o'clock service. And when we serve, when we have the ability to serve and to say, God, I want to be used of you, what that does, it empowers the foundational base to be stronger than anything that we could ever have. We need to train new children's ministries, new nursery volunteers, more media volunteers, more greeters, more parking lot attendants, equip the ushers for the worship service. We have to double everything. In order to double everything, I have to motivate you to say it's more important than to just sit and enjoy, but to get up and serve. We have to develop our music and fine arts ministry to be relevant and excellent. Develop our ministry in every area to be relevant and excellent. In order for us to go to two services, we are going to have to make major changes in every aspect of our church. And that means from our sound, to our lighting, to our video, to our music, to our praise team, to our choir. If this is a priority, what we have to do is we have to look at the vision of our church and say that we must maintain excellence so that when people experience Glenville, they see an innovative, creative, and well-balanced church. Everything must look like we are prepared for ministry to come in. We have a great team, but here's one of my challenges. If our church runs 500, 600, there should be at least 10% in our choir. That means our choir can't run 18 people on Sunday morning and be 10% of our church. That means our choir, if we're gonna have 500 people, 400 people, 100 people, we need to have 10% of the congregation ministering because that is a reflection of worship to God from our church. So we want to motivate we want to motivate, we want to communicate, not just dream, but cast that vision to understand having ministry means we have to look at what we need to do. And our drama ministry. I have empowered and I have uh, asked a lady to be in charge of our drama department, Bonnie uh, Bunch. Bonnie, will you please stand up? Bonnie Bunch. So when Bonnie comes around you and she is nice to you, she's not nice to you because she likes you. Bonnie is nice to you because she wants something from you. And what she wants from you is, do you ever act? Would you like to be? And you know what? And the Holy Spirit says, you know what? I have never acted before. I'm going to tell you the truth. I never acted before. And I, in front of the entire congregation, was in a dress on top of that platform, playing pilot in front of 700 people, and I was embarrassed because number one, I'm fat, and number two, my legs are really white, and I had to get up in front of everybody, and I'm saying, if I had to be pilot, if I had to act, you can act. You can get up and look just as foolish as I am because who you're doing it for, you're doing it for Christ. But we need to look at that. What can we do to make ministry exciting and relevant and changing? And then uh, children's and youth ministries. Let's start with youth ministries. We want to develop a strategy that our teenagers are part of Glenville. Not only in a church service down the hallway, but they're part of Glenville in Glenville. Last Sunday, they were sitting right in here. We had 80 kids sitting here in the front of the auditorium. What we want to do is systematically bring them into church. We want them to own Glenville as much as we own Glenville. So when they do graduate from high school, they say, you know what, the big church, uh... we want them to say, that's my church. And how they do that is we assimilate them into ministry. We give to them the service. They're on the last Sunday of this month, they're, they're doing the whole service. They're doing the music, they're doing the preaching, they're doing the entire thing. We want to assimilate them into ministry. I want them to know that our church ministry is for them. Continue to develop numerical growth. Having students give testimonies, praying for students to enter ministry programs, mission programs. Let them know that it's very important that our teenagers are a priority, not just something that we have just for special events. And then children's ministry. Children's ministry. How many of you guys have kids under the age of 12? Raise your hand. Would you say that your kids, other than Jesus, and maybe even more than your husband or wife, are your apple of your eye. You would do anything you need to for your kiddos, right? You would hit your husband upside the head if you needed to to protect your kiddos. In our society today, our teenagers and our kids and our babies are a priority. 
And in order for them to be a priority, we must look at their life, look at their ministry, and set an example of saying, we are protective and we want to love them and we want to teach them, we want to give them opportunities that they can see Christ at an early age and we want to grow them up with a passion for Christ. I could not tell you how many times in counseling I have heard this. When I was a kid, I went to Glenville. I bet I hear that five times a week. When I was a kid, I went to the youth department. When I was a kid, I rode the bus and I just got away from God. What I want is I want a ministry that when they see Christ at the church, they don't graduate from God, they move towards God. They have a passion for Christ. And how we do that is make, you know how, you know how big acorns grow, acorn trees grow? From a little acorn. We develop them at a very early age to cultivate them, to know a passion for God and a love for God and the ability to worship God. As they grow, what happens is that passion within their soul starts going out into ministry. They start singing, they start ministering, they start sharing their faith. Why? Is because we gave them cultivation when they were a child and that's all they know. They know a passion for Christ. We need that with our youth ministry. We need that with our children's ministry. It is paramount that we change the direction of our children's and our youth ministry to be totally focused on Christ and to build a community, not just an event. And then creating, uh, create and maintain a financial foundation for the future. Maintain a current giving base while adding additional 100 members to the giving base of our church. See, this is the paradox. What do you do? Say that, uh, say that your financial giving is in your home is stagnated. Either you have to do one or two different things. Either you have to what? Get more money or you have to spend less, right? Get more money or spend less. You can't live on your credit cards for very long. It's a slippery slope that you're going to fall into debt and you're going to file bankruptcy. It's going to be a major catastrophe for you. Either spend less or get more money in. We have a philosophy of our church that ministry is paramount. We cannot do children's ministry, youth ministry, band ministry, drama ministry, lighting ministry, outreach ministry. We can't do all that without resources. So the only way that we can do that is we have to gain access to people's lives, change their lives so they have a passion for Christ. And I love what Andy Stanley says, that there's enough people that agree with what we're doing that they give enough resources for us to accomplish what we need to do. So at Glenville, what I want to make sure is, I want to make sure our ministries, our ministries that you're excited about, that you bought into, that you're saying, you know what, I agree with them. I agree with what they're doing. I agree that they're reaching children. I agree that they're changing people's lives. I agree with what they're doing. I agree I will sacrifice in order for them to maintain their God-given vision to implement their strategy in order to reach a community for Jesus Christ. We want, to, we want to grow additional diving, giving base members. So here's the motto. We need to see it clearly, say it continually, and show it creatively. We need to do whatever it takes to change this community, change this church. And what we have to do is be, be visionary enough to see what is it that we need to change, to cut, to move in order to be successful. And then we need to reevaluate our entire missions program. This is a sticky wicket here. You know, it's impossible for a church. If I ask you, you know, how many missionaries that you know that we support in our church? You may say how many five to seven to eight missionaries. Well, would I surprise you to let you know that we support 70 missionaries? And you know, 70 missionaries. So here's what I'd like to do. And this is try to get ahead of the eight ball in our missions endeavor. What I would like to do, I'd like to shrink our missions endeavor not change the mission's money, but change the endeavor. And instead of having 70 missionaries, let's move that down to 20 missionaries. And let's take the money that we were giving 70 missionaries, transfer that down to 20 missionaries. Give those 20 missionaries more resources. So when they come to the church, they're not here for an hour-long Sunday morning program, that they're here so we build relationships with them. And when we build a relationship with them, then we have projects that when there's a need, that we can go into their field and meet that need. And then what I have an ultimate desire of is to own 
Glenville be part of something bigger than ourselves overseas. Whether it's an orphanage or whether it's a home for unwed mothers, whether it's a feeding center or whether it's a Bible college. That we own it. Our name is across the door. That when there's something that needs to be done, that pastor of that church or that ministry would call Glenville and say, hey, your church in this country needs something. And we own it. We take mission trips two or three times a year to go to that spot, to that program. And we own it, minister to it, and care for it. I want to see in the different demographics of our society today, the, the older way of doing missions was send a missionary to the field and we support the missionary. What we want in this younger age is we want to see we want to tangibly go to. We want to experience. We want to go on that mission field. We want to see those children. We want to see those, those young ladies that are pregnant and that, that got kicked out of their house and they have no hope and the church ministry comes alongside them. We want to tangibly see what we are doing. And I believe that if our church can tangibly see a missions project that we own, all we're going to do is do more missions Missions is something if we give and God produces and God blesses it, it's nothing but going to get bigger and greater because we're going to impact people's lives. It gets the eyes off of us and it puts the eyes on them and it changes people's lives. That's our missions endeavor. But if we are so tied to giving this missionary just a little bit of money so he can go on the field, we do not see, we do not experience. We can hear, we can read a letter, but reading a letter doesn't tangibly change what we experience. So we want to re-establish our missions program to grow it bigger, but in a different way. And then we want to, um, under the Constitution and bylaws, what we really want to do is we want to change leadership. We want more leaders. We need more leaders. Leaders. Somebody that will take God-given vision and help the direction of this church to go deeper and around the world. I want to appoint, as the Constitution and Bylaws allows me, I want to appoint some men in this church as trustees. Trustees to sit with the deacon board that maybe would not serve uh, as a deacon, but they will serve as a one-time or one-term basis for a one year at a time, appointed by the pastor to help the deacon serve in areas to take care of ministry. Not to be the boss, because deacon and trustees, you know, being the boss is not necessarily always fun. Having the final say is never usually fun. But what it does, it's appointed by the pastor and the deacon board to serve the church. And then my last one that I want to share with the last point is develop a volunteer staff team. A volunteer staff team. From the drama, to the worship, to the tech, to the Iwana, to security, to social media, to men's ministry, to parking lot, to deacons. People that will just serve. People that look at the volunteer base and say, I love my church. I want to volunteer. They don't gain a penny from the church. They don't gain access because of financial gain from the church. They just look at the church and says, I love the church. I, say, I see the vision, as I stated, the vision of Glenville is to continue to develop and maintain ministries of excellence so that when people experience Glenville, they see an innovative, creative, well-balanced church. But then it goes to the purpose. That's what God has given to us. A vision. So when you have a vision, what does that do? What is the strategy and where does that lead us? The purpose of Glenville is to first lead people to Jesus and then into a membership of his local church family. Develop them to Christ-like maturity and equip them to their ministry in the church and their life mission in the world. What we do as a purpose is to change people's lives, have a ministry of excellence for a purpose to change people's lives so they can reproduce themselves, so they can invite their friends, so they can catch fish, so they can be men and women of God. That's our vision. It may take us three months. It may take us three years. But if God has given to me awareness and given to you awareness and given to the deacons awareness and our light bulb is clicked on, it is a sin against God to say, not now. I'm, I'm going to stay where we are. Because life and death is in the balance. Our children, our youth, adults, community groups, people that need Christ, they're saying, okay, what do you do? 
I was met with some people this week that the first question they said is, tell me about your church. And I just got to, I just got to talk. I, I, I just got to talk for 45 minutes about things that are taking place and, and the strategies and the visions that we have in the future. So I had all these college kids sitting down and I was just talking to them about where we're wanting to go. And their eyes were wide open. And I'm thinking, I'm talking about a concept that is inspiring to me and it's inspiring to a bunch of college kids that are getting ready to go into ministry. But I do not have the courage to implement what I'm inspired about. How weird is that? I can talk a good talk. I can tell them everything that we're going to do and how God is going to do great things. But I sat there and I looked in the eyes and I said, but Bruce, you're just chicken. You're afraid. You're afraid to do what God has called you to do. So after this week, that last part of awareness, vision, strategy, is what? Courage. If God has motivated us to do something great to catch more fish, it's our purpose in life to reproduce others in Jesus Christ. We must do everything in our power to be well-balanced, innovative, creative, so when they see Jesus Christ at our church, they see a passion and a love for God. Not just a bunch of people that come to church and sing a couple songs, but they see love one for another. They see a passion to reach into people's lives. Not to hear a sermon and to sing songs. That's not what we do. We come into people's lives and say, you know what? I want to help you. I want to minister to you. I can't babysit you. But you know what? If we do love God, God will do some great things within us. So we need to use a variety of strategies. Use a variety of strategies. Nothing, nothing, and I say this one time uh, when, with our deacon board, and I, and I, I said it in jest, but I, I almost say it, it's true. Expect, use a, a variety of strategies. Uh, short of sin, I'm willing to experience. You know, if, if, if it is something that's going to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we can change people's lives, you know what? If I can glorify God in the midst of any strategy, I am going to strategize a way to reach people for Jesus Christ. People are in a world of hurt, and we are in a bubble. The church is in a bubble. And we think our world revolves around us. And the world does not revolve around us. What we have to do, what Jesus told them to do, is go into the world, preach the gospel. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you to do. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It didn't say, hold your holy huddle, and they're going to come in. Go. Do. Use a variety of strategies to do whatever it takes. And expect to catch fish. Expect to catch fish. I believe when the disciples threw their net on one side and they didn't catch anything all night. You know what Peter said? I don't want to, I just mended my nets. It took me forever to do that. He said, do it. And when they did it, and they had a net full of fish that was jumping into their boat, I bet from that time on, when Jesus told them to do something, what did they do? They expected that if Jesus asked them to do something, they would be successful. Because Jesus empowers them. So in your strategies, in your life, in your issues, what we need to do, if God has given to me a vision, and you become aware that you are broken, and you have a strategy, what we have to do is say, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm going to expect you to help me. I can't do it without you. So please, give me the expectancy within my life. But then I believe uh, we are to be patient if you don't catch fish immediately. If you're working with somebody, if you're ministering to somebody, just because you share them about Jesus one time doesn't mean that they're going to be turned on for Christ. Doesn't mean that they're going to come to church because you invite them one time. They may look at you and they may laugh at you, they may mock you, because you know what? It's not about the event. 
It's about your life in front of the event. They may look at you and say, I'm not into that church thing. I'm not into your God thing. What they're doing is they're going to step back and they're going to watch. Is that God thing transforming your life? And it may be after prayer, after weeks, after years, but when they have a major catastrophe within their life and they say, I don't know what to do. And then the Holy Spirit then comes into their heart and says, you know what, I need help. I have become aware. I'm going to give you vision. And God uses you to minister to somebody that is aware of their sin because of your testimony. They come alongside you. When the Holy Spirit directs them to you and the Holy Spirit was in within you, that's when that cosmic collision is going to take place and the Holy Spirit's power will work. You can preach, teach, hit them over the head all day long. You can tell them how great God is and what God has done for you and that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and how great God is and how wonderful your church is and how great your preacher is, how great the music is, how great the youth ministry is, how many people are getting saved, how great upward basketball is, how awesome everything is. And they're sitting and saying, what? Why would you put money into that? You, don't you see what God is doing? Can't you see how God forgave? Can't, no. Why? Is because the unsaved world is blinded to the very things of God. They think you are, many of you are, strange. <laughs> because their eyes have been blinded. Just like Paul on the road to Damascus. He was a persecutor of the Christians. But when he had an encounter with Christ, his eyes were then opened and he could see what God was up to. He changed the world. The world needs to have an encounter. You need to be able to communicate through your life what Jesus is doing in your spirit. And if Jesus is transforming your spirit, your life will follow. But if the world doesn't see a change within your life, but you are communicating a change in your spirit, there's, whoa, hmm. What are they going to believe? The words out of your mouth or the walk under your feet? Because they're never going to see what you say until they watch what you do. And that is when we have to have courage to say, it may be a small thing, it may be a big thing, but if God has opened up my eyes to awareness and he's given me passion, a vision within my life to say, I need a change. I need to start over. I need to confess. I need to do something different. If I always continue to do it, I'm going to be a failure in, in my eyes all day long. I'm going to make a change. And then how am I going to make that change? That's when the strategy takes in place. Awareness, vision, strategy. What do I do? It'd be great if we could say, okay, I got the vision from God, now I'm going to be perfect. No, I have to put into place a strategy. It may be a 12-step plan. It may be detox. It may be refinance. It may be counseling. But you have to to do the strategy, to put your head in the sand and hope everything will go away within three months. When you pull your head out of the sand, guess what? The bills are still there, the relationships are still there, the problems are still there. We have to put into place a strategy. And then once we have that place in strategy, that means every day, every morning, every night, we have to have the courage to admit, I need God. We have to have the courage to do what God has implemented within our life. That, my friend, is hard. Have the courage to do what God has called us to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we love what you've taught us. Whether it's personal or whether it's within the church, whether it's in our spirit, or whether it is in our flesh. I pray, Lord, these four principles will be ground 
into our life that we will be broken to become aware. You will fill us with passion and vision. And then we will implement. We will put into place what you need us to do and have the courage. Have the courage to make that change. To communicate to you. Because we cannot change the world until we first fix what God wants us to fix in our own life. So let us do that. Prepare our hearts and prepare our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for allowing us to minister to you. And, uh, um, you know, sometimes an invitation is when, you, when we sing a song and you come forward. And sometimes the song takes precedence. What I want today is I don't want a song in the background. I want the Holy Spirit of God just to talk to you. So I'm going to ask you if you would please stand. We're going to spend uh, two or three minutes in prayer. Just in a quiet st state of prayer. If you wanted to come forward and talk to God at the altar, that's what we want you to do. If you want to stand where you are and talk to God, that's what I want you to do. But I want you to look at these four things. Are you aware of something within your life, something within your ministry that you need to give over to God? You know that's broken. You know they're struggling. You're aware of it. And then ask God, Lord, give me that vision, that passion within my soul to do something about it. I know that I can't continue where I am and what I'm doing. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ and you've been broken and become aware that you can't go to Christ without first meeting him at the cross. And then allow that strategy to take place. And that's where help, that's when community groups, that's when counseling takes place. And then have courage. Many of you are sitting here today and you're saying, I've done all four, but I've lost courage. I've quit. I know what I should do, but I just haven't continued it out. I've tried it, but it got redundant. And because of redundancy, I just quit. Well, redundancy is a very bad thing, but quitting is worse. Stand firm. The Bible says die daily. Make a decision, stand firm, have courage, because Christ is right around the corner. But we have to be willing to do it for him. So I'm going to have a, a brief prayer, asking God to bless you, and then we're going to have a time of prayer, whether it's at the altar or whether it's in your chairs. Dear Lord, hear our hearts. Hear our prayers. Convict us. Release us from our fear. Give to us the courage to admit our failures, to give our life, our ministries, and our hopes and our dreams to you. You are our future. You are our passion. Give to us that desire today to be a follower and a reproducer of your will towards others by giving it today to us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let us spend time in prayer.